Hey guys, uh, Mom Vernon Kid here, coming to you again. How's everybody doing out there? Um, once again, like I said, I apologize for uh, the uh, lateness. I told you guys this was this review will be late. I apologize once again for not being able to do the review for the last week of December, because like I said, the 31st I had no books. Um, like I said, some things big personal things that came up and I uh, needed to take care of. Um, I still, uh, in terms of the giveaway for December, I'm gonna have to cancel that one and start off fresh with this for, uh, for J uh, January, um, as well as um, basically start fresh and as well, still have to, like I said, the pers that personal stuff really, really was personal. So I still have to get the last two winners gifts. So like I said, I'm a man of my word, and I promise you guys, I will be getting those to you soon. Um, so we're gonna, so we're gonna, I'm gonna review the books that came out last week um, that I finally finished, finally finished reading, um, and. Uh, Gonna deliver. We're gonna deliver this stack for you. So we're gonna go indie first, Marvel, and end it with DC. Okay. Um. So, so let's get a swab of ginger ale here. All right. All right, and we're gonna kick this off in dynamite. Um. With uh, Magnus, robot fighter number. 10. Uh, Fred Van Lint does the writing for this. Um, Roberto Castro, Castro, uh, Castro's artwork is really great. And still, uh, it's still the from the big cliffhanger that we got at the end. Now, Mag, Magus is, uh, Magnus is pretty much starting to learn that about what they took away from his life. And maybe the man responsible for that. And we're getting more robot, bio robot re revolution going on. Humans and robots fighting each other. Uh, Magnus finally, in this also, Magnus uh, finally meets maybe a robot. He can't find a weakness. See, Magnus, he he can easily look at a robot and tell if it's a robot, even if it looks like a human. And he also can tell look right at and look for and knows their weak spot and defeat them. So pretty much he's like Karnak, uh, but he does it with robots. And uh, But unfortunately he meets a robot that may not be so easy. And uh, Fred Van Lint leaves us with a major cliffhanger at the end of that. And I was like, all right, not bad. All right, so we move on to... Uh, still in dynamite. Shaft number two. Yes, uh, Mr. David uh, Walker. Great job, sir. Uh, like I said once again, this is a title that if you're not comfortable with the wording and the dialogue, then don't pick it up. Um, but in this issue, we finally get to see. Uh, Shaft becoming what he was meant to be, you know, the private eye, the super cat private eye, you know, and where he kind of got his start at it. And it's kind of interesting that he gets his start by uh, kind of being an undercover cop at a, like a a uh, a department store. Those are the cover cops that make sure nobody's shoplifting, and Shaft is really good at it. He can spot a thief real quick, and it's also here that he suppose he basically finds kind of his first love here, and from there, her the his the girl that he's falling for, life starts to her, her life starts to intertwine with shafts, and it gets deeper and deeper into when we're talk when I'm talking deep, I'm talking about the mob. And things like that, and uh, don't want to spoil too much, especially the ending 
but is really, really shocking, and you really felt for Shaft at the end of the of this issue. Very good dialogue at times. They kind of cut down on the the you know racial profanity in there. I mean, they're saying things that you would expect someone who is educated and someone who is not a racist to say. For example, when Shaft's being uh, he's employed by his uh, you know the man calls him Negro and it was like okay see that's that's I'd rather be here Negro or black or something like that but the other one but yeah you hear that word in there too um, but uh, Shaft showcases why he's so good and what what Vietnam did for him in a sense yeah alright so we move on to uh, part one of this mini series called Red Sonia uh, Vulture's Circle. Um, Collins, uh, Liberman, and Costa uh, do a good job on this. At first, it's, as first, if you've seen my mentor Blue Goblin's review, it kind of starts off a little interesting because it's a human sacrifice, and I'm talking, you talk about some violent, bloody shit. Yes, that sacrifice was bloody, gory, and it just was like, oh my god. But this seems to take place somewhere in, I guess, a possible future or so where we could see a kind of an older Sonya. Yeah, you see her hair is kind of not as reddish as it is. She's got streaks of gray or white in there. And she's trained. She has, like, in a sense, two disciples. She has a. She is with a man now and things like that. And uh, it's. Even though she's older, she's still Sonya. Don't let that, don't let the, don't let the gray hair fool you. She's still a she-devil, and she will get in some demon's ass, if you know what I mean. And we get to see it in this big time. And um, it was good stuff. Very good stuff indeed. All right. So let's move on to uh, Legendary Comics, Epochalypse, uh number two. John Hennessy, Shane Davis. Uh, this continues to be one trippy ride, in my opinion. Um, we get to learn a little bit more about the main character, where this world takes place, and how it's kind of a combination of the past, the present, and the future, all wrapped up into one. And it's kind of, it's it's scary. It is scary. Um, you do something wrong, these cops, these like law enforcement cops come after you. And we get to see that in this. And we get to see that the main character, he kind of doesn't like it. He, he has a conscience. And it I've seen storytelling like this before, you know, where a world is kind of like total to totalitarianism, you know, but there's one character that feels like this is wrong and things like that. So we, we kind of get this, the same thing kind of happens in this. But the artwork is really good. They're one of the main, I guess, the, the the boss of this police force looks like freaking Bruce Willis with a goatee. I'm not even joking. You want to see? I'll show it to you right now. Um, let me see if I can find it. No, no, excuse me. He doesn't have a goatee, but he looks like Bruce Willis with an eye patch. Look, what does that look like? Doesn't that look like Bruce Willis? But other than that, it was this was good. All right, so we we'll move on to Marvel. X Factor, number nineteen. On, uh, I believe next week is the final issue of this title. Excuse me. And once again, Marvel, why are you canceling this? What the hell? Why are you canceling? But anyway. The team faces this demon that has inhabited the body of this girl. And um, they're trying everything they can against this creature. It has nearly godlike power. And they know that they want to try to deal with this without really harming the girl because it's still her body. Um, but still, the with all their great mutant abilities and powers, 
they still are no match for this except for one member now this title has been out for a week now and I guess everybody should know who it is but I'm still not going to spoil it for you guys um, one of the members and that member is on the cover I'm not going to spoil who it is showcases that this God this being ain't got shit on that person and it was really good All right, let's move on to The Amazing Spider-Man, number 12. Anybody wants the code for this? This is still available. Um, this is a part four of Spider-Verse. Um, this was good, but I definitely have to agree on the ending just like how Blue Goblin said. I don't agree too much of that, of what's going on, but with with the ending. I'm not still not gonna spoil what happened at the end. The, the Spider-Man of the like post uh, nuclear nu nuclear bombing world that the inheritors can't go to. We saw Silk go into in Spider-Woman. Um, the Spidey and the rest of the spiders are hit hard and they're taking major casualties. Um, especially even with the help of a new Spider-Man, which is really cool to see. I'm spoil who it is. It was a Japanese Spider-Man with the big giant robot, you know, the one from the spider planet. Spider-Man! You know, that, that kind of threw me. I was like, oh, that was pretty cool. Um, but even with his help, he's still, especially with Big Bat, Big Daddy, that's what I'm going to call him now, uh, Molin's dad, uh, felt sorry for May, you know, seeing little Benji, spoil this for you guys, get taken, and um, it really hit me hard when she, what she said about them, like saying that, you know, we should go after Ben, you guys are not real Spider-Man, you know, my father was a real Spider-Man, and he's dead, and it was just like, I was like, man, I know you're upset, but why you say that? Your father, act, technically your father's standing right next to you. Um, but other than that, still good. Um, uh, Jessica is starting to get some information that will be vital for the group. But uh, And Ock is still acting like a dick and a jerk that he is always. Um, you can't change a dick. You'll never change a dick. And I better stop saying that because that just coming off really nasty. Uh, but other than that, um, it was good. But the ending, I was just like, oh, come on, not a, you know, really, like, really, like. Angela, number two, Asgard's assassin. Uh, Gillian, Marjorie Bennett still do a fantastic job with this title. We're only two issues in, guys. Um, now we get to know what the relation of the baby that Angelus took from Asgard in the first issue. Um, it's her sister. Angela is the daughter, as you all know, of Odin and the daughter of Frigga. There you go, Gabi. That's how you say her name, Frigga. Not Freya or whatever you said it to. It's Frigga. Um, and um, we, she even gets to see, you know, her mother. And she kind of is like, okay, I kind of like you. And they kind of give the backstory and things like that. But she steals the baby. And that's why the Asgardians, Thor and Sif and Heimdall and all of them are after her. Uh, we don't know why she's taken her little sister. We don't know. There, I, there's no real explanation of why, in a sense, but she took her. And uh, her and her friend travel to Midgar. And there's a great scene with this little girl. You probably heard it before. And the ball. And I uh, thought that was really fun. Uh, yes, Angela can hold her own in a fight, as we all know. I mean, she's been doing it since she was with in the image universe with Spawn, so it's like, 
I didn't expect any less when she came over to Marvel. Um, but later on, we get to see uh, where they end up. They end up later on in the issue, and it was really good. Thor is just like he. It's funny because Thor is like I got two siblings that pull that stupid magic trickery, and he 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 fed up with it. I, I thought that was pretty funny. Um, but um, this was good, and it continues to be good. Um, if if you keep Gillian and Marjorie Bennett on it, it'll stay that way. Um, very much. But I, I definitely want to know what is the ends to the means of um, Angela taking her little sister. All right. Uh, let's move on to Ant-Man number one. Here it is. First of all, I love that freaking cover. I love it. Um, now, I know a lot of people are kind of complaining about the pricing. I th I don't know what Marvel is doing with that, why they have, like, the first introductory issue be $4.99. I don't know. But uh, was this book worth the money? Yeah, it was. That's just my opinion. Nick Spencer does a good job with this. We get to see the through the eyes of and through the world of Ant-Man Scott Lang. He has skills. He's had a past. He's not rich. He's pretty much damn near poor. He has no clothes, you know, he he walk and throughout this whole issue he's in his Ant Man outfit. He's got a bitter relationship with his ex wife. He loves his daughter, which they really it seems like they've kinda de aged her, Cassie, after Doctor Doom brought her back to life. And that was when Doom was inverted, thanks to Axis. It seems that she's been kind of that's just from my perspective. She's been kind of de-aged, and she seems to don't have her powers anymore. That's kind of what I got from this. Um, there's a competition held with Tony Stark, and you know, uh, about trying to become head of security for Stark Industries. And Scott is in a contest with uh, Ex Machu, uh, Prodigy and the female hornet and stuff in here is just so funny you just see um scott watching you know tony getting it on with the the female uh, hornet and he's like oh come on tony i don't need to see this and it's pretty funny um people just like Hey, weren't you dead and things like you're not you're not Hank Pym and thing is it's just it the way they wrote this issue was to really make you feel like sometimes when you when some of these heroes take over another take over the legacy it's kind of hard for them and I'm glad they showed that in this Nick Spencer showed that in this even though Scott has been around for a while but still he's it's still kind of hard for him because of the fact that he's been dead, and you know it, they play up the fact that he he's dead. He really has no, he can't really get really too much of a real job because he's dead now. His social security number is gone. It they play that up, and it was just like it made you think. And I'm and I was I'm like, you know what? That is true. When these heroes come back to life, they are really ghosts in the wind. Watering in the wind. Um, the ending is really interesting as well. Um, and it makes you wonder where it's going to go. Uh, but I can tell you that Scott is in the sunshine state with his daughter. Um, but a very good start. A very good start. Not a lot of action, but good dialogue, good storytelling. Nick Spencer, you did a great job, sir, with this. Um, 
believe that I would say believe the hype if you hear everybody talking about this. This was really good. Um, I can't wait to see when uh, my mentor reads this. Yeah, that's coming for him for his Midtown stash. I have that on his pull list at Midtown. Um, Iron Fist, the uh, the living weapon. Um, Mr. Andrews still is telling the story of um, Danny recovering from his beating that he took from the one, that's, that's the name of it, who has his father's face. And he's, he, you know, his hand's been broken. He can't really tap into the power of the Iron Fist. Kulun has been destroyed. Why, Marvel, why all of a sudden now you want to destroy all the mystical cities or the great cities? First Wakanda, now Kulun. You know, what's next? You know, you're going to do it to Adelan? You're going to do it to this? Come, come on. Um, but uh, Danny is recovering and he's going through some trials thanks to a couple of friends of his that have helped him out. Um, and he's in this world kind of the Chinese mytholo mythological world of the dead. I think it's called, um, the, what, was, what was it called? Uh, uh, Dayu? Dayu. And he gets to see his mother, who was like chained. And when his mother sees him, she doesn't really recognize him because the last time she saw him, he was just but a boy, his birth mother. And uh, she's like, that's not my baby boy. And it's almost like literally she he reverts to a young boy and she's like, there he is. But then he reverts back. He's like, mother, I'm I'm a grown man now. And he's like, let me get you out of here before these demons come to devour you. She's chained up. And she goes into detail why she's chained up. It's not for it's more of vengeance. You see, you for people some forget why what happened to Danny? Why he came back to the real world or Earth when he, after he became the Iron Fist, it was for revenge because of the death of his father by the hands of supposedly his father's best friend. And we get to see that. And she's like, she's literally telling, you're just like your father. You could be a great, you're a great man but you have trouble letting go of the past. The chains are kind of linked of being the past. And that was really good storytelling. I gave, I give Mr. Andrews really good credit for that. I was like, that's interesting. And from there, it's almost now, in a sense, it's no longer about revenge anymore. It's about redemption. And he even, Danny even says that at the end. And I love Danny's new look in a sense. It's kind of Bruce Lee-ish, and that's why I loved it. Um, it's really cool. Uh, you get, you probably won't get to see it too well, but that's Danny now. That's pretty cool. But this was good. Punisher, number 14. Oh, I forgot to mention, guys. Uh, Iron Fist Living Weapon code is still available, and this is still available to the Punisher 14. Mr. Edmondson, you do you're killing it with you're killing it with Frank. Uh, Frank takes the fight to the new Howling Commandos. They have the last remaining family of the Punisher. His I think his um, his his brother-in-law, his brother and sister-in-law, and Frank takes the fight to them, and uh, he does a pretty good job. You know, Frank, as always, you know, Punisher's gonna go in, but he even knows. And I love the line that he. I love the line. Um, I gotta. I gotta say it. Uh, he talks about him being. He once was a marine. And he uh, uh, he fought he he fought under the a banner, which was the American flag, and then he goes on to talk about I'm still fighting under a banner, but it's not the banner 
It's not that banner anymore. You know? And I love that. Good dialogue in here. Um, and Frank does his best. He He's in a building, because that's where he's in a hotel. That's where the Howling Commandos are holding. And he uses his wits and charm and his skills and to get to the Howling Commandos. And he even starts to wonder. He's like, why you bring innocence into this if you just come at me if you wanted me I'm right here and uh, he does his best but you gotta remember Frank is outnumbered he's outnumbered I believe five to one um, and uh, it doesn't end too good for Frank at the end I, I, and I was like whoa wait wait a minute I know you're not doing what I think you're doing but um no, it didn't. But it didn't end too well for Frank at the end of this issue. I'm looking forward to the next issue because L.A. is getting, has become like a freaking war zone. Um, but this was damn good. Speaking of damn good, this was damn good, too. Um, gotta agree once again with Gabby. Uh, Spider-Man 2099, uh, tying the Spider-Verse, Peter David just killed it on this title um, uh, Miguel and Lady Spider are trying to get readings from um, one of the inheritors what is his name uh, Dios I believe that's his name uh, Deimos and they start to realize that Deimos is no fool and uh, Deimos is able to do some things in here, and you're just like, oh. And, uh, I don't want to spoil, but there is another, uh, there is an appearance of another, uh, 2099 version of a character. Actually, I'll give you a hint. I just reviewed the next, I just reviewed the 2099 version I just reviewed previously, previously. Prior to reviewing this title, yeah, so yeah, it was that that guy, and it was really cool to see. Um, I, I would have been cool if we saw some more 2099 versions, like the X Men or Doom, um, things like that. But it was good to see that character too, and um, I love the line that Miguel he's like, "We're not really friends, friends, but you know, I called in a favor. I needed his help." Uh, and unfortunately, it ends like, it, once again, Peter David's great with those dun-dun-dun moments when Miguel and Lady Spider return back to, quote-unquote, the safe zone. They get a rude awakening. Excellent. Code still available, guys. Then we move on to Storm. Number seven, Greg Poth, thumbs up. Storm, yes, this this happens. She is in FBI custody. She, she is in jail. She's not in jail, really. She's in custody with the FBI um, because last issue she was on a plane with the senator. The senator believed said that she is the one that took the plane down, is trying to kill everybody. We all know that's bullshit. Um, so they're listening. So Nightcrawler, Beast, and Rachel are listening to this on the radio. So what does Rachel do? She telepathically talks to Storm and she's like, what's going on, Storm? Just like there and you know, and you know, they got Storm shackled that her leg hurt. She has a broken ankle. She passed out in, in the last previous issue because she was so exhausted from literally holding up a plane with her powers, um, 747 to be exact, and uh, she, and they have like these power dampeners on her, but Storm once again shows why, you know, it's not about the power that a mutant has, it's about, it's more than just the powers, and we get to see that, you forget, people forget, and I love that story, uh, Greg Pak brought this up, People forget, Storm was trained as a thief, so she can break out of shackles, and she 
she was just literally talking to this FBI agent. She and she she and even Storm says she she knows she she I can't blame her. She's only doing her job, you know, things like that. But uh, I've been out of these shackles at five minutes ago when she breaks free, goes off, and you know, basically gets free. People are protesting about letting Storm go. It was really good to see. Um, and Storm knows that there's more to what happened, especially with the senator. And that's where the plot even thickens even more, which I don't want to spoil. But uh, this was this has been great. Storm has just been great. Um, very good. Uh, sorry, guys, the code for this has been taken. Somebody took that already. All right. <laughs> Let's move on to... The unbeatable squirrel girl, number one. Um, I want to get the name of the, the people right who did this. Um, Ryan North, and artwork by Eric Erica Hen Henderson. Um, the artwork, I was expecting, like more of like a kitty Archie feel like artwork, and that's kind of what we got. Um, I wasn't expecting to see how Mike Diodata drew Squirrel Girl, and uh, yeah, Mike Diodata draws drew Squirrel Girl was like, okay, she's got a tail, but god damn, you know, it's like that, you know what I'm saying? But in this, we get to see that Doreen, that's Squirrel Girl's real name for anybody who doesn't know. Her real name is Doreen Green. Um, She's going to college. Um, she's been living in the Avengers Mansion attic with her, her you know, her faithful squirrel, Tibido, Tito, Tito, what the hell? Uh, uh, Tipito, excuse me, Tipito. Um, and she's trying to balance the life. And you just see her talking to Tipito. I like that they just don't have her Tipito just going, tuk, 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 like at times you actually see what. He's saying to her because Squirrel Girl can understand her, sorry. Um, but then when somebody else sees it, it's chugga, 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 you know, like a, what Squirrel's talking. Um, she's fighting criminals and she's singing a, a mock version of the Spider Man, Spider Man, but m with her. Spider Girl, Spider, no, um, Squirrel Girl, Squirrel Girl is like, and I was just laughing the whole time. Um, she meets her roommate, her dorm room roommate, um, who has a pet cat, and pretty cool, you know. Um, and then, of course, the big major threat is that she runs into... <laughs> she runs into... She tackles with Craven the Hunter, one of Spider-Man's most deadliest enemies. And while I'm reading this, I was like, you know what? She brings up a good debate with Craven. She's saying to Craven, she's like, why do you think Spider-Man is the most deadliest creature? And then you got Craven like, well, you know, nobody has the great combination of speed, strength, and and agility and things like that. And you know, Squirrel goes like breaking it down. She's like, Craven, you know, you have never you couldn't beat Spider-Man, and you know the only way you're immortal. The only way you're going to die is if Spider-Man kills you, which we know that won't happen. So as a great hunter, why aren't you going after these impossible mythological creatures? She's showing them cards like, uh, like the. she's like, why don't you go after like the, the Krakens, these creatures that are only, you know, Kraken or something else creatures that are only like seen once in a while, you know, and she plays off of that. And I thought that was well done writing by Ryan North. I was like, I'm laughing my ass off, but I was like, you know what? She is right. This was just a fun book to read. Um, I'm glad I picked it up. I will stay on board with this. If this continues to make me laugh, I'm going to have fun with it. And, uh, Tippy Toe leaves a big message at the end for Doreen 
of somebody big is coming and yeah I'm just gonna I'm just gonna end it right there um X-Men number 23 this is a new uh, arc listen um Marvel why don't you just have Terry Dobson do the artwork for this um I didn't like the artwork in this the story is was all right, but I gotta agree. The story so of as of late with this title has been really going down. I love that it's an all female X Men group. I love me some Psylocke. I love me some Rachel. I love M. I love every girl in this book. But the quality of this book has been since the first issue and up has really gone down. I did not really like this story at all. Um, not at all. I I literally kind of read through this book just like that because it, it all honesty guys, I'm gonna be honest, it, it bored me. It actually bored me. Um but uh hopefully um the only part that I did like is the scene with Storm and her vision of Wolverine. You know, she's deep, deep underground, and you all know Storm is claustrophobic. And I thought that was okay. But other than that, I still was like, uh. And the, like I said, the artwork, I wasn't too, yeah. But yeah, there you go. All right. Well, just checking my time, guys. All right, so we're going to end this. Here's all the DC books. Here we go. Let's, let's move on. Uh, Aquaman and the others, number nine. DC, why are you canceling this book? Aquaman can't have two books. Oh, but Batman can have three and four. Superman can have two, three. Even Diana has two. Arthur can't have two. Really? I like the others. Why are you canceling them? Dan Jurgens, sir, you do a good job. Um... Prisoner of War has really lost control of the souls that are in, in him. And uh, that's pretty much the basis of this. As well as KG Beast and Cheshire and all of them really trying to stick it to the team in this. And boy, the day ever kind of stick it to them. Uh, I really don't want to spoil too much of this. But, um, yeah, payback. Oh, yeah, good stuff, though. <clears throat> Detective Comics number 38. Uh, this was great. Um, uh, Manipool and Buccello. Fantastic. New 52 version of Anarchy. Wow. Holy crap. Um, this was from point A to point B was spot on. Was it perfect? No, but nearly perfect. It was great. Artwork great. Dialogue great. Action great. Anarchy is bringing the anarchy. It was good to see Bruce take up his Matches Malone disguise. I always like seeing him when he donned Matches Malone. You know, it's good to see that. Uh, it just gets really, really impactful. Especially, just anarchy is just, this dude is not fucking around. And it's like, holy crap. Um, what he does to Bruce or to the Gotham PD at the end was like, oh my God. Uh, Earth 2, number 30. Um, this was okay. I didn't... The cover is nice. I'm not gonna lie. This was okay. It, it, it's really just explaining um, the the avatars of the different... What is it? The white, um, blue, red, black. Black meaning decay, white meaning um, atmosphere, 
uh, green meaning organic life, uh, blue meaning ocean, and red meaning savagery, basically the power of the animals. It was good. It's it's okay. We get to see that uh, Alan wasn't the, the only avatar. Um, some a person close to him was one, um, and it's all about being they're preparing for the coming of apocalypse. Uh, I think my favorite, uh, besides Alan, will probably be uh, will probably be the white. And maybe the tie with the blue. The red, I was a little bit like, eh, okay, like, but it, it is what it is. Um, it was cool to see, I believe that was um, the female wildcat, uh, Yolanda uh, Morales, I believe that was it. Yeah. But other than that, it's, it was okay, you know. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it was okay. So now let's get to some, once more, some good stuff. Uh, Green Arrow, number 38. Uh, so we get a new 52 team up between uh, Green Arrow and Green Lantern. Old school for guys like me who remembers Green Arrow, Green Lantern comic. Um, the team continues to do a good job with this, and uh, we get to see that even though these two are teaming up, there's still a little bit of a, like animosity between each other. I mean, Ali, you know, Hal literally calls Ali a jerk. Uh, Ali says the same. We also get Katana in this, and you know, she's calling both of them weak-willed, you know, because they won't take the step of killing and things like that. Mia has been brought back with her dad, and it's like she doesn't like her dad. She spits in, and she literally spits in this her dad's face, like. Fuck you. She literally says that to him. Um, she go on talking about that. Her father killed her mother. And, you know, her, we've seen, I've seen stuff like this where the father's like, I, I just want to give you everything you need. You don't have to do this and sell yourself. Well, you know, things like that. Um, but we do get to see some good teamwork between Ali and, and Hal. Um, Felicity, I believe it's Felicity, was it, no, I don't think it was Felicity, no, was it, I think it was Felicity, hitting on Ollie, flirting with him, flirting with, no, flirting with Hal, uh, which was kind of funny, and he's like, are you flirting with me, she like, I don't know if what flirting means, or flirt, fl how to flirt, so, um, it was interesting, um, but then after the deal was done, um, you know, Ollie's like, I gotta go, things like that, and you know, no, no, Ali, how, excuse me, is like, I gotta go, and Ali's like, well, wait, you should, come on, stick around. Now, once again, they keep to the fact that Ali is not supposed to be on Earth using his ring. Once again, in Green Lantern, there's a deal that the Red Lanterns are the Earth protectors. The only Green Lantern that's allowed on Earth on, is Simon Boz. And, uh, but Ali is, uh, Hal is there, and he's just like, you know what? No, I, you're, you're not the only important thing, you know, you're jerking, you know, blah, blah, blah. It, it was going back and forth a lot. But, uh, this was good, nonetheless, and it ends with a, once, another dun 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 moment because something happened, and uh, now, in a sense, Ali is public enemy number one in Seattle. Um, and there's a bounty on his head. I'll leave it at that. Okay, last but not least, Green Lantern number 38. That cover sums it up a lot. Um, ben Diddy does a good job with this. This was good, very good, because of the fact that it, it wasn't dealing with space and this and that. It's all just about how Highball Jones, uh, Jordan, I said Jones, Jordan, you know, he's he was told by the Garden to go back to Earth, things like that. And we get to see that. He's gone back to Earth, and they told him, you, you stay on Earth, you know. Uh, 
you stay. Don't 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 come back until we call for you. So um he goes and of course guy meets in there and is like, look, I'm not I'm just gonna be here. You know if you don't want me here, don't want me here. Uh but he goes to a famous bar that he used to go to, you know, where he was a test pilot and he's catching up on good times and next you know here comes Guy. And he's like, what the fuck, man? Like, and then not just Guy comes here, here comes Barry. Now Barry hasn't seen Hal for and they say about a year. He's been off the Justice League for a year now. Or two. And um they get into a bar fight. Hal gets a little pissed off at both him and Barry. You know, and next you know, here comes enter Carol Ferris. And uh, we all know what goes on from there. You know, he's you know, Hal is still hurt. You know, he's hurting. He's he's like, you know, look, you know She's like, Yeah, you, when I was I knew where to find you. Even you know, we grew up together. You, when we were boy, when you were my boyfriend. I knew, and then how is it? But you're not anymore. Hence, we all know what's going on. Carol is now dating Kyle, and you know how's he's, I would say semi okay with it. He says that he's okay, but he's hurting. He's hurting big time, and he knows that. You know, he he want he still loves Carol. You know, he and he 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 tells her he's like, look, I I still love you, I love you, and I'll always love you, but you know, you know the good guy routine. You know, but I, as long as you're happy, okay. And you know, she says, yeah, but Carol does kind of break it down for how it's like, you know, you need to find yourself in a sense. Like, what are you? Are you test pilot? Are you intergalactic cop? You know, things like, what are you? Or are you both? Um, you know, but still, you know, he, he, Hal still can't, you know, he can't just get over the fact that his girlfriend, that he has been with for, like, forever, is now dating, quote, unquote, as he said, an artist. I didn't even know artists, you liked artists, you know, in this it's kind of hard for him. You can, you can, un I can understand Hal's kind of. I don't want to say animosity, but you can understand like, like I, we've been through. You know, he even says it. We've been through the kind of our relationship was kind of rocky, but we've always made up for it or something like that. But in the end, it just wasn't. You know, it is, and he's just like, you know, maybe, you know, maybe we we will be back together, but. Is this closure on finally? Can we close the box on the Hal Jordan Carol Ferris uh, relationship? I want to say yes. Don't know. I can't officially say it's over, but as of right now, Hal can move on and Carol can move on in their lives. And maybe we'll get to see. Maybe maybe DC. You get Hal a girl. You know, get somebody else that maybe Hal can be with. You know, maybe somebody who is even in the Green Lantern Corps with him. You know, maybe him and the Sornak could, Sornak could make a good couple. I don't know. You know, but I think that would be kind of weird. Hal dating Sinestro's daughter. Like, oh my God. Like, I guess you. I, I'm thinking of Sinestro's looking on my shoulder like, Jordan? You know, things like that. I'm just messing with you guys. But um, other than that, this kind of gave this relationship some closure for now. Um, but uh, it was good. Very good. It was just straightforward, good storytelling, good stuff indeed. Well, guys, that was all the books I had for last week. Um, I will be picking up my books for this week. Um, and things like that. But other than that, thank you for watching, as always. Um, this is Mom Burning Kid saying peace, my love, stay tuned, keep real, guys, as always. 
I'll see you guys next time with another review. And as always, my fellow geeks, stay up. The Omni Geek High Lord of New York is out. Take care.